And yo, LAZ, Gen Pop Gang in the building. Shout out to the bro, Gunny Walker. You heard, Marine, veteran. Shout out to all of the veterans out there. All of the soldiers out there. Those currently at war. Those who seen war and combat. You know, these dudes got some stories. They got some deep and powerful stories. And we got to start hearing some of them. You know, it's not just ex-convicts and street dudes that need that therapy and need to get things off their chest. It's a lot of people out there. You heard? But this story right here, this need to be a movie. And that's a fact. You heard this need to be a whole movie. It's a lot of stories on this channel, man, that need to be a movie. Gen Pop, y'all gotta start spreading the word out there. You heard when you hear a story on this channel that you know for a fact could be a major motion picture. Tweet that, share that. Send that to whoever you know. We drag and grab, not even three minutes while we going, we, we got to leave the orphanage and we driving by the Pakistani stadium. Bro, they lit our shit up, we lit our shit up, disabled one of the vehicles and we literally had a run and gun fight, bro. It was like four and a half, five miles all the way back to the ship. Have you ever seen the movie Black Hawk Down? Yeah, I saw it a long time ago. Okay, so that happened in 1993, October 3rd, 1993. Well, uh, I was on, I was in Somalia um, from August of 1993 until late November of 1993, and uh, my unit, um, we we were. Uh, doing a convoy, we, what we were doing, we were ripping out another platoon. So we were, we were replacing a unit that was already in country. So that use that process usually takes about two weeks, two and a half weeks, depending on the time that you have. So uh, October first and second, we have been running major operations in and throughout Mogadishu, and um, October second, the night before the, the Rangers did that raid, another Marine and myself, we had took the, we were taking these VIPs around the city. And we ended up, one of our last stops was gonna be at an orphanage. So we get to the orphanage and like I said, it's two platoons now um, working together. So this guy from another platoon placed me and this other Marine in a spot to do overwatch while the VIPs were walking around the orphanage. Well, some shit had bust, some shit had happened not too far from where we were. So it was like, you know, the SOP was, you know, get the, get the VIP out of the area. But since our platoons were together, the guy and, our, and the comm and all that shit was fucked up. The dude had pulled everybody and left me and this other Marine out there exposed. Now they dipped. So we was in the we was in the cut for like a good 25, 30 minutes. And we was like, yo, somebody should have checked in with us or something. And we hear this person coming down the hallway where we were, and it's this little beautiful sister. And she's like, are they gonna come back for you? And we like, what? And I'm looking at the, there's a white dude I'm with. I'm looking at him, he's looking at me. He's like, we're like, yeah, 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 they coming back. So we go back and hide. We, we, we back in another hide for like another 20, 30 minutes. Now, the whole time I'm on my Raykel on the radio trying to raise the unit, the element, nothing. I'm, I'm keying the mic, radio silence. The lady comes back, she goes, they know you're here. You have to, you have to leave. So we like, what? You know, I'm like, what you talking about? She's like, they know you're here. 
it was like, uh, you know, I'm we still kind of believe it oblivious because one of the, the main rules that we were taught from boot camp is you never leave anybody behind. It's always a two man rule. Like you have to be accountable for everybody. So I left the dude in the hide. I walk out with the lady I'm trying to talk to. And I just peeked outside of the orphanage. I took a little peek outside. And you ever been to the wrong neighborhood and people know that you're not from that neighborhood and you walk outside, you walk back out, you go inside the store, you come back outside the store and you it's just people, just dudes, just they just was out there. So we go back, I go back inside, go to my dude. I was like, man, it's getting ready to get sticky, bro. We gotta, you know, we think it right there, we gonna make a last stand. So she says, I, I might be able to get you some help. Just hold on. So about five minutes later, some Italian dudes, some Italian Marines show up and we knew where our unit was going after they left us. So we like, all right, just take us to the flight line and we'll be all right. So them dudes took us out to the flight line. We got to the flight line, our unit was gone. So. The, the Italian dudes, they fed us, got some food. Another, it was, it just so happens it was an Italian dude from, from Long Island. He says, hey man, because he spoke perfect English. He came over, he says, hey man, I know where some Marines are. And we like, oh shit, woo, all right, cool. Gotta be our guys. Man, this dude took us to the back and it was, it was two Marines back there. Uh, they were communication and intelligence guys. It was a sergeant and a, and a lance corporal. And they living in a connex box. Now, if you could just imagine, we in Somalia, we on the Horn of Africa. So they at the beach. So it's on one side of us, it's the Indian Ocean. On the other side of us is Mogadishu, Somalia. So the dude is like, man, the best I could do is I could call your unit and let them know y'all are here but you can't stay with us because there's sensitive materials. Like, nigga, listen, we got the, the highest classification clearance there is known to man. There's nothing that we can't see. Because I belong to a unit, it was fast company, it was a fleet anti-terrorism strike team. So, and I was a part of the frog unit. So it was a fast reaction operational group. So we were privy to a lot of different things. And because we were we were assigned to guard the embassies and, and different sensitive stuff. We had those clearances, so it's not like you couldn't have put us up. But he's like, I, I, he called the unit. He was like, I let them know, but we have we have reason to believe that this base is going to get hit tonight. Y'all can't stay here. And we like, we looking at each other like, what the fuck? Now the dude outranks me, and I'm like, well. What do you suggest, Sergeant? What, how, you know? He's like, I don't know what to tell you. I'm like, all right. So me and the dude, we dig a, we dig a, a fighting hole, a spider hole at the bottom of the connex boxes. So like I said, to our left is the Indian Ocean. To our right is the country of Somalia. It's starting to get dark. These other two Marines, they came, they closed up their little connex box, they locked themselves inside the connex box, which I thought was kind of crazy, but anyway. So we just what, sit, well, we did. Not to interrupt you, but what is that, a connex box? It's like... So, uh, you ever seen, um, it's, it look, you know, they be on the trains, they transport, uh, they transport uh, every, all, all kinds of things on ships. So it's just like a, it's like a, a, a big metal box. Oh yeah, I know what you mean. And usually they sit on the back of a, a eighteen wheeler, but you'll you'll mostly see them on the back of trains. And usually, what they do in certain certain combat situations, what they'll do is they'll actually fly them shits in country. They have the engineers come, they dig a hole, and they put the connex box in the hole. So you got like a little bit of protection. But these niggas lived in a connex box where the one they were working out of was underground. And the one they lived in was above that one. It was stacked on top of each other. There wasn't enough room for us to be in there. And I really didn't want to be in there anyway because it's just a it's just a kill trap. That shit is a bullet magnet. So me and, me and my boy Flea, we, we got back to back. Like I said, we dug a spider hole slash fighting hole. And we just 
making all, you know, hey, if something happens to me, you do this. If, if something happens to you, you do this. It starts to get dark. My man, the world went crazy. We start seeing traces come over us. The base is getting hit. The, the Italian Marines we were staying with not even a couple hours ago, their shit's getting mashed up. Everybody's getting mashed up. So, what I decided. You mean dudes this, is coming through there. You mean uh, some air strikes? Or, I mean, how? What no, no, no. They just they shooting just shoot, it up? I just, yeah, they just shooting it up. And, and Somalis, and I don't even sort of. El less developed countries, you'll notice sometimes when they show the reports coming back, these dudes be on the back of these uh, these Toyota trucks. We used to call them technicals because they could put anything on the back of that shit. They could put a 107, they could put a 12 millimeter, they could have put a 50 cal, they put anything on the back of them shits. And they're just, it's, it's a mobile transport. It's, it's like a, a, a troop carrier, like even a tank, but it's a Toyota. So what these dudes would do is they would run go back and forth up and down the line and just busting off shots if they had motors in the back of them they could bust them shits off that 12-7 was wicked they could bust them shits off so like i said once it got dark the whole world just opened up it literally sounds like fourth of july you know when the shit just start coming off and it just rumbles 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 so we know we're in the bad place so I look at I look at the other Marine I'm with. I was like, we know that there's another spot that we could go to, but our dilemma is now it's dark. There's there's running gunfights all over the place, and we have no way of identifying ourselves to anybody, and they don't have any way of identifying themselves to us. So we I'm 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 a brother, the dude I was with here, white boy. So you figure if if we stack up and we start moving, if I'm in front, chances are I might get shot because I look like a Somali. If he's in front, he might get he chances are he's gonna get lit up because the Somalis are gonna notice that he's not one of them. So we in the dilemma. So we in a running, literally a running gun battle. We so y'all came out, y'all came out of the joint that y'all dug? Yeah, we had to get out of there, bro. We had to get out of there. L literally, it was the ocean on, it was the Indian Ocean on our left-hand side and the city. So, like, I uh, felt like they was about to find that and, and just tear it up or what? So not only that, but what they would do is like, okay, say you say you standing across the street and I'm I'm in the middle of the street. You know where I am, but I don't know where you are. So you would fire some shots at us and disperse. And then you might fire some shots at us and disperse. So you using a clock method. We, you, when you first started firing at us, you was at 12 o'clock. When the second time you open up on us, you at three o'clock. You open up us at us again, you at six o'clock. Now, between between you and me, there might be friendly forces on the other side. So somebody could at 12 o'clock could take some shots at us. If we open up on you after you left, we might end up shooting at, it might be blue on blue. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to get ourselves someplace to an elevated place. We didn't want anything behind us. We wanted to get to an elevated place. So we know nothing's behind us but we could see everything we was in an ideal spot originally because the indian ocean was behind us there was nobody that could sneak up on us but we could we had no field of vision in front of us you know the the rangers were on one side the italians were on another side the pakistanis were on the other side so we could take incoming but we couldn't see we didn't have a clear shot to anything we didn't know so it could have been it could have been u.n troops shooting at us it could have been anybody and for us to try to defend ourselves from that position it would have just they, people would have been able to get too close to us too quickly for us to you know especially it's just two of us um he had a he had a remington 800 i had the remington 800 i had a i had my 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 um M16A2 with my 40 millimeter grenade launcher um, and nine millimeter Beretta. He had one, I had one. So I only had about six rounds, six rounds, seven rounds 
a 40 millimeter. That's the grenade launcher. I had 120 rounds. My loadout was 120 rounds, five, five, six, 30 rounds, 300 wind bag, 45 rounds, nine millimeter. He had the same thing minus the M16. He didn't have, he didn't have an M16 because he was the designated marksman for this operation. So all he had was his Remington and he had 18 shots plus the 45, 45 nine millimeter shots. So we could not sustain a defensive position up for more than you know, it it would have it would have been we would have got killed, bro. We would have got wiped the fuck out had we not decided to move when we did. So what we decided to do is we left where we were. We made our way to the Pakistani stadium. If you remember, during in Black Hawk Down, that was one of the major rally points for the UN was the Pakistani stadium. If we could get there, we would be all right because you know we we would be able to. At the very least, the, 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 the guards at the gate would recognize that we were we were we were multi a, a multinational force, and they would have made a corridor for us to get through. So, as we get to the we leave the flight line, like I said, it's 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 pitch black. Um, we had one. I had a Raquel. Uh, we had one night scope, but other than that, we didn't have no nods and nothing like that. This is in the 90s, so we didn't really have all that high speed shit. So we we finally make it to the Pakistani stadium. So, whew, all right, cool, we're good. But it's not good because the Pakistanis, they don't fight. So they would, they would let the Somalis overrun them, take their shit, do whatever, hoping that they would spare them. So once we get to the top of the stadium, we realize, okay, this wasn't the best thing to do, but at least we up high. We hired, we hired in, I wanna say 80% of the buildings within a good 300, 400 yard radius, which gives us an advantage because we got the long guns. So we set up a high, we snooping the poop and we picking off, we can pick off, but we don't wanna do too much because it's only us two. We don't have any calm. So we we just gotta we just gotta have patience and hold it down and hopefully make it to the morning. Because we knew that our unit knew. Let me ask you this one thing though. Go ahead. Has it ever was it ever uh has it ever been known for one of them Somalians to show love to a black US soldier? So that's, that's, yes, sir. That's that's the point I was getting ready to get into. So, uh, one of the, th not a lot of people know exactly what was going on in the ground on the ground in Somalia. Um, I, not too many people know that the the main warlord during that time, Adi, his son was an American citizen, and he was also a Marine. But he was with the 1st Marine Division who had already come and go. But what we had, we had an arrangement with USALO, the United States Liaison Office, is when we, when the Americans first got in the country, what they would do is if y'all were the top three clans, for them to get a way in to, to, to divide and conquer, that's the only way that I, I'm not gonna hold back anything. The only way, cause it was, people not eating only the strongest clans the strongest groups got the run of the country there's a lot of political shit a lot of tribal shit going on over there so what we would do initially when we first got in country is we would train members of the group that the dark side was working with and we called them dark side but we knew that they were Department of State, CIA, military intelligence. So we would work with them and we would train the younger the younger men how to protect themselves or defend themselves or what have you. So I wanna say maybe three, four o'clock in the morning, 
we see a big group of Somalis moving in our direction. Now they're not firing, they're not taking no fire, they're not shooting at nothing. And the, the crazy shit is, we watching these dudes and they having a conversation with the guards. Y'all inside or outside at this point? We're, we're inside, but we're, you know, stadiums is open. So yeah. we're inside the stadium, we're up high in the stands. But we're now exposed. What, what you mean stadium, not like what? A stadium. Uh, it's, it was as actual uh, as a football stadium. Oh, and they was Soccer using stuff. it. They was using it as like a base. As a as a rally point. Yeah, they had you know uh, U.S. United, United UN coalition forces had a lot of heavy equipment, tanks, armored personnel carriers, and it was just one of the. It was a. It was a. It was one of. It wasn't too far from Bakara Market, um, and it was a stronghold for the UN, and it was big enough. For them to do whatever they needed to do with their equipment. So, as like we said, we're watching these dudes, and the dude is motioning to us, like he's motioning in our direction, not the Somali dudes, the Pakistanis. So I'm, I hit flea on the leg. I said, "Yo, this nigga is showing this motherfucker where we at." So we was like, "Fuck it." And we laced up. We, we, I got, I had a, I had a smoke grenade. He had a Willie Pete grenade. Anything happens, we're gonna bust the Willie Pete, we're gonna dip, and we just gonna we're gonna fall back and fight. Fall back and fight. Whatever we could do. Cover and maneuver. Shoot, move, and communicate. So about three minutes after that, one of the Pakistanis came and he's like, uh, there's some people downstairs, they say they know you. Now, nobody knows we're in this area last. None of our people know that we that we are. The last thing anybody knows is we back behind them Connex boxes. Nobody knows that we here. Come come to find out that the lady that was at the orphanage was either a aunt or a cousin of a group of kids that we had been training weeks prior. So I go down, I see the little shorty. I remember him, his name is Maldu. He's like, Walker, you gotta come with us. And I'm looking at, I'm looking at the Marine I'm with and he's already scared. And I'm like, I don't know, bro. I, he's like, you can't stay here. You, we, you gotta come with us. So I said, hold on. I go and talk to Philetus. I say, flee. Whatever happens, bro, we, we just go all out. Don't You don't turn your back on anybody. I don't turn my back on anybody and we'll just go. But we had trained these dudes. So what they did is they brought us back to the orphanage, put us on top of the roof, and they stayed with us until just before sunrise and they left. And maybe about 10, 15 minutes later, our unit came to pick us up. So now this, now when they came to pick us up, that Black Hawk Down operation is going into effect. We don't know it, but it's starting to bust off in the city. And that picture that I had sent you, we used to carry around these little bullshit disposable Kodaks. The little Kodak cameras, you know, the little, the little yeah. is made out of cardboard. Yeah. So as I get into the back of the, because we used to drive around in these Land Cruisers, skirted out, and just had to be like one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars a piece, two hundred fifty thousand a piece, because it was fully armored, crazy leather and all that shit. So our unit comes to get us, we bag and grab. Not even three minutes. While we going, we, we got to leave the orphanage and we driving by the Pakistani stadium. Bro, they lit our shit up. They lit our shit up. Disabled one of the vehicles and we literally had a running gunfight, bro. It was like four and a half, five miles all the way back to the ship. And it was, when you talk about being terrified, but the thing was, 
here we are with a hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment on boots camis this that body armor second chance vest da 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 the shorties that came and picked us up they had on flip flops and ak-47s b mm. for the for for people who don't know like what exactly what was that move what was that about the black hawk down situation like what had happened out there so uh what they were trying to do is they were trying to catch the heads of these clans so there were there were four or five major clans in the in the in the city of mogadishu and then you had clans from the outskirts of somalia and what they were trying to do you know at the horn of africa man is a very logistical is very is a very important you know place uh logistically um and i it's my belief that the united states was trying to control the horn of africa because if you can control the horn of africa you basically can control that that the top entry point to the red sea um, it's in close proximity to Ethiopia. I mean, it's it's just a it's, it's it's a big place. And you know, Adid was a part of that group that went to the School of America, so he knew things about the older Bush that I'm sure they didn't want to come out. You know, he was in that class with Noriega, uh, uh, the dude from Venezuela. Like there's there's a lot of things, bro. That, that <laughs> you know that we don't know the full story on. Mm. But it, basically, they wanted. I see. Since Adib was so influential, they wanted to get these guys so that they were thinking that if they were able to get these guys, everybody else would fall into place. But that's not how Somalia is, bro. The people will fight. They have knocked off every every colonizer that has tried to come into that part of the world mm. whether it be the italians the germans because i we were meeting somali kids children pardon me we were we were meeting somali children that could speak three four different european languages on top of the arabic and the clan languages you know, so it's a very powerful landmass, and then those dudes were just trying to do whatever they could do to destabilize that region. And because, you know, Adib, at one point, did the bidding of the United States, what better way to continue to get into that part of the world than to get him out? But, you know, it, it backfired on him. Um, it's still not a stable place today. They do have people in that part of the world that are working there um you know they they it's like everybody all over the world dislikes the things that the united states does and they're not standing for it anymore so i mean that's really the biggest now, the biggest part of the before, thing we're just trying to yeah, that's crazy, man. Before we was recording, you said something that was real deep. You said um, two things. You said you was talking about you was in, a, you was feeling like you was either going off yourself, or because you know, of course, man. Uh, I know a couple of dudes who who saw serious combat, and when they came home, they was never the same again. Like I've seen dudes go from. You know, happy, sharp, intelligent dudes, young dudes. And I know a dude who did two tours in Afghanistan. And he mm -hmm. came home. And, you know, I don't see that happiness no more. Listen, man, listen. I went to a school. I went to a school once. And at the, in the front of the class, they had in big letters. Murder was invented before man began to think. Now man is known as a thinking animal. And the intelligence of human beings, think of the intelligence that it takes to be an architect, the intelligence that it takes to be a, a surgeon, an attorney, just the, the intelligence that human beings possess. Now, 
take that individual, make his life rough for a few months, and teach him the art of war fighting, bro. And at the end of the day, let's let's not get it messed up. Murder is murder, bro. Murder is murder. And and the thing is, when you go through, and I can't speak for any other branch, I can only speak for the Marine Corps. There's but so much that they can do in training to simulate the actual combat. But as 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 powerful as this body is, as all the wonderful things that you see human beings do, whether it's <laughs> hitting a baseball, dunking, uh, finding out the theory of relativity, this is a bag, bro. This is a, a very fragile bag of meat. So if you've ever had, if you ever seen, you know, back in the day when girls used to do their little hair or. You know, people burn their nails or you the smell of burnt hair. You can't unsee certain things. That's just like Shah was talking about on one of these episodes where he he's seen so many things when behind the walls and so many other other people that you have on and they talk about the things that they've seen, the, the, the person that you have to become to survive in an environment. But they train you, they train you, they train you, they train you. But you know what happens? Once you do what you've been trained to do, there's no place where they bring you in and say, hey, this, that, and the third. Or even take it, compare a human, compare us to a, a computer. So if you, you, you get a computer, you want your computer to do certain things, you go ahead and do something to the hard drive, you take the hard drive out, you fix it up, you put it in, the computer can do whatever you want to do. There's no way that they can bring us back in and take out what we've been exposed to, what we had to do, what we've experienced, what we smelled, seen, heard, take that all that shit out and put us back in there our original self before we was exposed to that. They can't do that. So yeah, like, I, I, it, took, it's, it has taken me years, bro, to put myself back together simply because once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. Once you've heard it, you can't unhear it. And you know, there's been some wonderful, um, there's been some wonderful, um, things that they're able to do with um, uh, psilocybin and mushrooms and this and, this and that as far as um, getting these, these veterans a reset. But for the most part, it doesn't happen, bro. And you think about it, man. When I think about it, if you think of, if, if I tried to use what I was trained to do and the freedom of our people, they would do me just like they did that sheriff from LA so many years ago. You know, it's different when the rabbit got a gun. And you know, it's crazy when I, the day I got back from Somalia, blood on my boots, my people come to pick me up. I grew up in East Chester off of Gun Hill, East Chester Projects off of Gun Hill Road. So my people took me to White Plains. We went to a club, Act Three. My family, my cousins, blah, blah, blah. My cousin ended up getting stabbed up that night. Like we spread out on the line. Him and, the, him and my other dude, they walk up to the front of the line. This dude, I don't really know him too hot. But he pull out a burner. He re I guess he must have realized he, he, he used a burner to cut the line and then must have realized before it was time for him to go into the club, oh shit, I can't take this in with me. But the niggas he backed up off the line, they didn't leave, they didn't go anywhere. So when he left the line to go put the shit back in the car, my cousin's still in the front of the line. The dudes that got off the line, they ate him. They just rushed him from all sides. What we see is the commotion up front, blah, blah, blah. So I see my cousin, he get off the line, he walking back because we was dispersed throughout the line. 
So he holding the collar of his shirt. And I'm like, yo, what happened? What's up? Yo, lads, he let the shirt go and just squirting, blood squirting out. Oh, we like, oh shit, jump off the line, grab him up. All I know is I go to my T-Triple-C. Boom, you know, where's, you know, stop the bleeding, stop the bleeding, treat for shock. Boom, boom, we, we just trying to stop the bleeding. We get in the car, drive to the hospital. He lives, and the only, you know, the, the doctor said the only reason he did live is because we were so intoxicated that night, he didn't go in the shop. So I'm, this is bugging me out because not even 12 hours ago, I'm on the ground in Somalia. And y'all dudes is over here fighting with each other about nonsense and there's people all over the world our age fighting for their freedom and y'all dudes is out here trying to murk each other for a cut in line or you think it was smart enough for you to go up to the head of this line you don't know who is who and you pull out a you back out a burn on somebody and you don't do nothing come on bro Come on, bro. We spent, we've been spending so many years and wasting so many, so much manpower. But you think about it. There's two people, two types of people walking on this planet right now. You have the one person that's a, original to every part of this planet. Anywhere you go, you have seen proof that we are there or we have been there. Then you have another person on this planet who's not aboriginal to any part of this world. And when these both individuals go into the military, you get you get uh, uh, transported all over the world, and you watching the news reports that are coming from the United States, and you would think that black people are destroying America. Now here you are, you a white boy, you all over the world killing shit that don't look like you. I'm getting kind of heated, so pardon my language. Here you are, you running all over the world, doing all kinds of crazy wickedness to people that don't look like you. So of course, when you come back to the United States, it's easy for you to kill something that don't look like you. So here we have America now that's been in battle. They've been in a major war for the last 20 years. Why do you think inside of the last, I wanna say eight to 10 years, there has been a such an uptick in murdering black boys, black young people, black people in general. Cause my man, they've been spending the last 10, 15, 20 years killing people that don't look like them. So it's easy for you to get out of the police car and just let it go. We used to have a saying going through training, when in doubt, let two out. So it is easy, bro. You, it is easy to kill something. It's hard to make, come to terms with yourself as a human being, especially being a, a person of melanin. That is that, like I said, when we first started this conversation, I have done more crimes against humanity than any person that you have interviewed for this channel. Think about it. Think about what you got. You went. You you spent your little your little vacations behind the wall. Think about what you was doing, and think about what they did to you, bro. I can show you a couple after action reports from my unit and show you the awards and medals and my fruit salad on my uniform. You ever notice when you see them dudes in, in military uniforms? They got the little the racks over their left breast pocket, right? Mm -hmm. Every other one of those ribbons and medals means murder. It means murder, other than the good conduct medal and the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, 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 service, the, the active service medals, everything else there is for murder. Everything, everything. Combat action ribbon, uh, meritorious service ribbon, uh, Naval Marine Corps uh, service ribbon with combat V.
silver star, bronze star. Come on, bro. That's again. That's that's why. That's that's one of the reasons it is so easy for these dudes that's riding around here in these blue uniforms to murder us. I guarantee it is. <laughs> We just we just got to do better as a people, bro. And 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 to hear the stories that I've been hearing, especially with with that brother um, Ebron, to hear his 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 passion and his pain come out when he talks about just I, I couldn't even imagine having that type of job. That's why after my after my enlistment, when I got out, there was no way that I was gonna go and do law enforcement because I had seen so much wearing that uniform as a Marine. And I'm coming home, you know, I get leave, I come home for 10 days, 30 days, sitting sitting on the corner with my people. They happy I came home. You know, we might be drinking on a little 40 or something. The boys roll up, they roll up. Sometimes they will roll up and pull their guns out not knowing that it's a, a gang of guns in the bushes but they just coming out like bullies and then you know hey hold on i show them my id hey show hold on man um chill oh yeah you stand over here well why the fuck i'm standing over here well you're a marine and with, i said no nah, no nah, the, the only reason these dudes are standing here is because they i just got home and we having a couple drinks we're not doing nothing we ain't hurting nobody you know what I'm saying? So there's, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of work to be done, and I see it on my end with the work that I'm doing with these young people. I'm a Bronx dude. I grew up in the Bronx, but I'm literally 350 children deep in Brooklyn, just through the the, the work that I've been doing at the Promise. You know, we got three groups of six and seven year olds, three groups of eight and nine year olds, three groups of ten and eleven year olds two groups of 12 and 13 and then we got a teen an adolescent group and i mean bro i i i i see i talk to eight-year-olds six-year-olds seven-year-olds nine-year-olds every day and if we don't do better we are, are gonna lose more and more of our young people and i think that's why i i use this i use this your platform in my in my teen study group because you know I got there's some young men and young girls that are trying to get active now and you know that this gang this gang shit in New York is just crazy at least you know when I was growing up we had the guards and you know you know maybe a couple of crews but there were rules when we was coming up there were certain things we just wouldn't do I'm 54 years old and I still have respect for my elders. Well, why, how is it that these young people don't respect us anymore? What happened? What happened to that? What did we do? Or what didn't we do? And, you know, I do have my master's in social work. And what I'm finding out, man, is these young people, they're angry with us. Just like we were angry with the guys in the previous generation. Cause they ain't leave us nothing and we out here naked there's no way there's 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 no reason for us to have the level of violence that we do in our neighborhoods and not be in a position at this point and our soldier in this part of the world not have the ability to control our neighborhoods or pardon me control our communities so you can't just come in here and do what you want there would be there wouldn't be any trayvon martins there wouldn't be any sandra bland there wouldn't be they wouldn't just kill us wholesale the way that they do because they knew if they do something to us something could happen to one of y'all and if, if people ain't smart about it, if people not really looking and looking at the times now, America's slowly, slowly fading away. That whole mindset, all of that, all that story that they, that 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 story that they 
convinced the whole world that this was the bastion of, of, of freedom and equality. Nah, bro. We're seeing it now. Our young people are seeing it now. And, you know, we, we, we have given birth to a cold, heartless generation. I don't know how many years between you and I, but I, I would have to say that your generation got like the last part of the the the, the, the raising of, of of a child. You know, you had certain rules, you had brought up seat. You know, there were certain things that you would and would not do. I can hear it just when you talking on your lives and everything else that you are honorable young man. So what happened? And then when you take when you when you take a when you stop and you look at the, the people that's younger than you, I know I know you even sometimes it's like, God damn, like we never did no shit like that. And we was wild. I grew up, you know what I'm saying? Like I said, I'm 54. I was born in 1968. You know, 78, I'm 10. 88, I'm 20. So I came up in a New York that was like, holy shit, like it was a bombed out place and all of this. But at least even then, there was a sense of community, bro. You know, you couldn't just go to any uh, anybody's block. You couldn't do any, even in your on your block. There's certain things that you just didn't do on your block. Now I'm seeing levels. I'm seeing things. I'm seeing how young people do things, man. That uh, it's hard for me to fathom. It's hard. Yeah, it's because nobody, nobody in power that has that level of influence is having the balls to just you know change the narrative everybody mm -hmm. want to stick to the script to get a dollar and you understand here, what here's, I'm saying here's another thing too I, I read a report man a couple of years ago um, uh, I'm in the process of working on my PhD right now um, there was in, in, in Africa what they started doing is because they were killing so many bull elephants they started to see the younger bull elephants do things that they've never done before mm -hmm. I mean they were, they were raping each other they were raping they were raping rhinoceroses they were killing people like the, the young bull elephants were doing things that they never ever did before it's safe to say that the same thing is occurring in our community. I'm not supposed to be here, lads. I could tell you, like when I listen, when I listen to your to to, to your to your podcast, and there isn't one that I haven't heard where I say to myself, "Yo, that that could have been me, bro. That could have been me." And it just, I, you know, when when I when I could have, you know, when I could have went, when I could have went left, I, it was always there was always an adult there that checked me. There was older, there was always, and it, even if it wasn't an adult, it was an older, it was an older young man or older woman that was like, listen, we don't do that, don't do that, or we took accountability for each other. If I did something in my neighborhood. Trust and believe. By the time I got home, my mother knew what was going on. Or somebody in the neighborhood would check me. Man, you say something to these little dudes out here now? They want to let you have it. Straight so up. I, I mean, you know, I feel like I feel like you know, I I grew up. I was young in like the early '90s, late '80s, and you know, dudes, it was some, it was some brazen things going on at that time. But now it's like. These seem like a bunch of kids who who were never raised by anybody. Like it was a few of those in the hood back then. It was a nice handful of those of dudes who they they have no parents to raise them. They was just out in the streets on their own raising themselves. But now it's like it's hordes, it's hordes of kids that's mm -hmm. raising themselves out here now. Mm -hmm. It was a few bad apples in the bunch that just didn't have a decent upbringing or a decent parent in the home back then but now it's like man you got gangs of kids that's out here raising them raising their own raising it yeah. raising themselves 
and 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 listen, Laz, I gotta say it, and I, uh, you know, <laughs> it's it's because it's. I think this was done intentionally. I mean, like we were speaking time, about. Yeah, I mean, like, bro, you know, we we're a people that we're still suffering from the effects of slavery. No matter how much how much people want to act like it was so long ago, whatever, whatever, it's still we. It's you could actually see, even with what's going on with me, how many haters I got and all of that. These are effects of slavery, man. You understand? Mm -hmm. We are. We were taught to bring each other down. You feel what I'm saying? And it's like it comes from being poor for eons. It comes from living in condensed neighborhoods, four block radius neighborhoods with thousands and thousands of families condensed into one area where everybody trying to get the same fifty dollars. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And we at each other's throats because, you know, life is hard where we come from in these ghettos mm -hmm. and in these projects and stuff like that. So we end up developing we end up desensitized to the to the to the feelings or lives of others like you understand yeah. like either we get this money or we gonna be poor living in extreme poverty and seeing our loved ones our mothers our sisters brothers suffer so dudes start doing er erratic things and making erratic decisions until that becomes the normal behavior you frown, niggas, fr niggas, people look down on you. Oh, you ain't out here trying to get no money and take care of your family? You a sucker. You understand yeah, what I'm saying? Man, it's, it's crazy, like the, the moral, it's just, just a moral decay, man. Yeah, it's man. Just a moral decay, but you got people like you out there doing stuff. And let me tell you this, bro, just for the record. Like, you know, as far as the things that you can't unsee and you feeling like a murderer and stuff like that, the bottom line, because of what you had to do when your back was against the wall, like, bro, you know, none of us knew the world was this ugly. Mm -hmm. Even when you signed up for the Marines, you may have been excited and wanted some action, but none of us knew that the world was this ugly. Yeah. Because where we come from, it's some or it's some it's some order. Like we take this for granted, but this is order. Like where I'm sitting at right now doing this interview, I'm in a pretty decent neighborhood in the Bronx. And okay. I'm looking at, you know, people going into the CVS and people going into the Dunkin' Donuts, minding their business. But while 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 you're telling your story, I'm thinking about what could be going on in Somalia right now. Mm-hmm. You feel me? So it's like, this is a matrix right here that comes from, you know, all right, we're going to give y'all an area where people can live a normal, half stress-free, half anxiety-free life. But in the real world, people are going to war for their simple freedoms. Simple things. Shoes, socks, it's the right to be there. Just the right to be there. The right to be right here. Just the... the, the <laughs> Yeah, bro. So, you know, whatever you had to do when you was over there, I know, you know, that way on your conscience, man, because we're human beings. And as we get older, we have more regrets of what we did when we were young. Mm -hmm. When you young, dumb and full of cum, you do a lot of stupid stuff that when you get older, you look back on and say, nah, that was that was wrong. Like, I shouldn't have did that. You mm -hmm. understand what I'm saying? So you can't beat yourself up for that, because like I said, none of us knew the world was this ugly, man. But it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, I mean, I've been putting it back together, man. Let me tell you, bro, I got some warriors, man. I, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I probably the luckiest man alive, man. You know what I'm saying? I got I got five beautiful sons, man. A wonderful wife. Um, you know, I, I get to I get to act like a six or seven or eight year old or nine year old every day, man. And, and, and just being that beacon of light to tell these young people, man, that there is a better way, bro. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna get knocked around and there's gonna be trials and this whatever, but you know what? Keep getting up, keep applying that pressure, make sure your heart is clean, don't hate on anybody. Like I can't even understand how people can hate on you, but I can, you know what I'm saying? Because it's the shine, bro, it's the shine, it's the shine, it's the it's the glow coming through you. You know what I mean? And and the and you know, every it seems like every week you get like another thousand followers. Every other week you get another thousand another followers and you just you from the heart with it, man. You can see, man. You pure with it, man. Appreciate you. Pure with it.
LAZ, if you love what I'm doing on this channel, you already snow cone. Feel free to send a cash app donation.